A while ago I did a project and it was to make the simplest possible solar charged set of lights that used a fairly cheap standard solar panel, a salvaged phone battery and just one transistor and two resistors and diode and could drive a string of LEDs so that when it gets dark the LEDs light up, when it gets daylight again they go out. Uh, very very simple and I thought I'd do an upgrade in this. I should mention uh, for those that commented about that, I stacked the battery off the back of the solar panel on foam pads, two foam pads, just for extra distance, just to stop heat going, because uh, if you've got this out in sunshine, you don't really want to heat up the lithium batteries too much. It's better to mount them far away from things like this. But anyway, I've already digressed. Let's draw the circuit diagram, because we're about to do an upgrade. And for this, let's uh, tame this down just a little bit. I'm going to be using a MOSFET, and the reason for that is that in a load of Chinese stuff that I've taken to bits recently, they used a MOSFET called the A2SHB, and I got some. I just thought, this is an amazing little thing. It's a, a transistor that can be turned on with a very low voltage, because that's how MOSFETs work. They're sort of voltage operated as opposed to the current operated, like traditional transistors. But it can switch a huge amount of current because it's got a very low resistance, and despite the fact it's absolutely tiny, let me show you one here. I'll just bring it in and pick it up with the tweezers and put it on the paper. There we go. That's the transistor. It's absolutely microscopic. That's not great when you're my size. Big fingers. Tiny transistor. But we'll get by. So I'm going to draw this schematic, and I'm going to be introducing some other things in this video that are quite interesting. Another product from China, in fact. So let's just nudge down a tiny little bit and I'll draw the schematic and it is super simple. So we start off with the solar panel. The solar panel will have to put out more than about 5 volts. In this case, I'm using this one. And if you count the number of sections, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, it's roughly half a volt per section. So this is going to put out roughly 6 volts. The current from this one will be in the region of 50 to 100 milliamps. It's not a big solar panel. Uh, B1X56, is that sort of dimensions or something? Not really sure. I think it is usually based on dimensions. So here's the solar panel, and it's going up there. So that's the positive, and it's going across to the other end of the circuit, which is the lithium cell. Now, the lithium cell I'm going to be using is a phone lithium cell that usually has protection in it, but not always. And I have to say, I found one recently that didn't have protection. The circuit board was there. It looked as though it had a protected circuit board, but it didn't. So I'll be testing that afterwards using the, the shunt technique, putting a high current load across it to see if it protect, triggers the internal protection. So this then uh, goes down here and it goes back to the solar panel, but there's a diode. Now, normally, if this was a simple charging circuit, just for ease of following the circuit out, I'd put the diode up here pointing from the, the output of the solar panel towards the lithium cell. Let's just write Li for lithium and PROT for protected. But in this case, it's useful to have the diode in this part of the circuit. It doesn't really matter. You can put it up here or down here. Up at the positive rail, we point in that direction. Negative rail, it points this direction. The next thing we're going to be doing is we're going to be adding the MOSFET. The MOSFET, let's draw it here. I could draw a lazy MOSFET. Will I not be lazy? Will I draw a proper MOSFET? Okay, the MOSFET symbol looks like this. It has the little arrow going in like that for the end channel MOSFET. The output going like that. And if I wanted to draw a proper MOSFET, I would also draw a little diode inside that looks like that. To be honest, that, that, that's just an inherent, inherent feature of MOSFETs. They have this diode just because of the way they're actually made. My normal lazy MOSFET is really just going to be like that. It's just going to be like that because it's easier to draw. I don't think it really matters as, as long as you know what it is in the circuit. So then we're going to have a, a resistor. In this case, actually, I've included the option for three resistors because like many of the other products, and I have to say that one of the most inspiring things recently, aside from, you know, I should get some of those inspiring things, well, one of them is uh, this car. It's a mechanics light. It's uh, This one's angleable. I've not taken this one apart yet. And it's adjustable. You vary the brightness with this potential to no flickering because it is using that MOSFET as a variable resistor. The other thing that really inspired me recently, I'm just going to grab that right now.
it was this. This little solar light that used a MOSFET and was absolutely whacking current through it. And I was really surprised just how I initially thought the MOSFET was heating up. It turned out it was the resistors next to it were fudging the thermal image a bit and it made it look as though the MOSFET was heating up. And in reality, when I masked it off, it was stone cold. It was really impressive. So that's the resistors, which uh, that's based on that uh, solar light and possibly the automotive lights as well. And I've allowed, in my design, I've allowed three resistors just because it spreads a load between them. And it means you can use the little tiny surface mount resistors and it's scalable. But the factor in the end will be how much heat the MOSFET dissipates because it... In normal operation, as the light level goes down, after it's finished charging, as it gets dark at night, this will operate in its linear region for a while. It's not a decisive straight on and off, and that risks actually heating the MOSFET up and it's acting like a resistor. But uh, the other thing we have here is this string. Let's just draw it as a couple of big points, connection points, because it will be. And then a string of LEDs. LEDs in parallel. I'm going to be using, surprise, surprise, Poundland LEDs. Some of their Christmas stock, I think it is. But uh, having said that, it's kind of all year round. It's there's no actually, you know what? It's their summer stock. I've already modified it. I've cut the battery pack off and I've put a little Molex connector on. So uh, yeah, let's uh, since I've overdrawn that, let's add another LED. There's about twenty of them in that string. You could drive a hundred LEDs or just one high power one if you wish. Now here's the really ridiculously clever bit. The gate of the MOSFET is connected to this side of the diode and there is a high value resistor in this case I'm using 10k now this is a good time to explain the difference between a traditional transistor and a MOSFET with a traditional transistor that looks like this I should say an NPN transistor a bipolar transistor one of the first that was ever invented to drive this transistor it amplifies the current going in between the base and in the case of an NPN, the emitter, so the collector is the bit that collects the, that goes to the load. That's where it would connect to these resistors and LEDs. With a traditional uh, transistor, if this has a gain of, say, about 300, if you put 1 milliamp into the base, this will switch up to 300 milliamps for load. But the MOSFET is very different. Whereas this one, uh, it's typically about 0.6 volts. It looks like a diode between the base and the emitter. But in the case of the MOSFET, uh, it's not current operated. No current really flows into that. It, in the style that it's pictured here, it's kind of almost like a capacitor. It is an insulated gate, as they say. That is why it's called, uh, well, an insulated gate bipolar transistor uh, is a sort of hybrid. It's a MOSFET bipolar transistor. That, that was a major diversion. Let's not go there. That's a complete different specialist transistor. There's a hybrid of these two. But a MOSFET, metal oxide semiconductor field effect transistor, relies on the field effect of a charge in this plate uh, pushing down a little effect of an electronic barrier inside here that lets current flow through. The downside is that normally with a MOSFET, traditional, the earliest ones, it took about 10 volts to actually turn them on. But this is great, this one. It only takes about two to three volts to actually start turning and then to turn it on fully. Um, and as I say, no current flows. It really is so sensitive that you could just put your finger in a battery terminal, touch the terminal of MOSFET, and it would turn the MOSFET on. That is one slight weakness. They're very sensitive to static electricity. You have to be careful when you're handling. Uh, the other characteristic that's useful to know, the voltage rate and current rating, power dissipation, etc., it, the one that's useful to know is the on-state resistance when it's fully turned on. And the, whereas with uh, these transistors, they, there's a slight voltage drop across them and they always dissipate a bit of heat when they're under high load. With MOSFETs, the resistance is super low. It's almost like a wire link or a switch across that. They turn on so hard with such a low resistance that uh, their heat dissipation is very low. And that's what means... That's what allows this tiny little component here to switch a lot of current. It means when they fail, everything goes pear-shaped quite quickly. But that's not likely to happen here, I don't think. So what happens here is that when the circuit is charging, this uh, end of the solar panel, let's draw a couple of beams of light coming into it, solar panel, uh, this end goes negative and current flows and it charges the lithium battery. But it also pulls the 
gate of the MOSFET down to the zero volt rail, it pulls it very slightly down below by this diode drop below the the, uh, the source terminal of the MOSFET source emitter gate. That will all make sense later on. I'll explain that some other time when I talk about MOSFETs because they're worth investigating on their own. When it gets dark, the solar panel stops putting out current, the gate gets pulled up to the positive rail by this resistor, and it turns on and the LEDs light. And because the lithium battery is protected, once the uh, if the it doesn't have enough charge to run the LEDs all night, when it gets down to its lower threshold, if it gets there, uh, it will cut off. And likewise, if there's excessive quantities of sunshine to the point that that solar panel actually manages to charge this right up to its full 4.2 volts, as soon as it exceeds that, the little protection circuit inside will cut off and it will limit how much extra how much charge gets put in. It will turn the charging off. Uh, technically speaking, you wouldn't need this 10K resistor, but I've included it anyway. By including it, it lets you adjust the load across that uh, to actually determine its sensitivity when it turns on at night. I found this turned on kind of early-ish, but not too bad. Technically speaking, if we get rid of that, the leakage through the solar panel itself could actually turn that on. I'm not sure how well that would work. I've never really tried it. And that's the circuit. And the thing is, because it's a surface mount transistor, uh, this time it's going to have to be made with surface mount components. So I've designed a tiny little circuit board. Here is the circuit board. It looks very pretty. Really odd design the circuit board because I'm used to working on the other side of the copper with standard components. And the colours are usually uh, green and uh, red in the top for the uh, screen print. Uh, and the sort of like the green background. But because the copper is actually on top this time, it's uh, blue on the print circuit board designer. I've just basically put surface mount pads in roughly position, measured them. I've used all 1206 size components because they're just that tiny bit bigger for my big ham-fisted fingers. And I've also the, used a diode just salvaged out of another kit, but I've also now ordered some diodes. Ideally, this would be a Schottky diode uh, because it's got a lower drop that could result in greater efficiency. But in this case, I've uh, just used an ordinary diode because it's what I had. Um, oh, things worth of note. Here is the MOSFET with its uh, gate being t connected to the negative solar panel and then the diode going to the uh, source. This windy track here is simply for thermal reasons. It's to keep the heat from the resistors, not they're going to get that hot, away from that uh, terminal, the um, drain terminal of the MOSFET. Took me a while to remember source, gate and drain. I will explain that some other time. Uh, right here. So there's the three resistors in parallel. That's for the LEDs. I may just put one in or I may put two. I'm not really sure yet. I shall uh, improvise as we go along. So because this is tiny, I'm going to be using the Trumpy brick. I'm going to be bringing this little foam brick in to try and bring things up. I'm going to brighten the image up. I'm going to put the battery on that I'm going to be using, which is this little lithium battery here. So let's uh, focus onto that because that is a good focus point. Is that focused nicely? It's, it's, it looks pretty good. Yes, that, that looks all right. I'm just double checking. Right, uh, and here is the tiny little circuit board that I'm going to stick on top of that. And to be honest, I think I'm going to start off by putting it on with a double-sided pad. So let's do that. Let's get a double-sided pad and physically stick the circuit board onto the lithium battery before I even start soldering because... Uh, Otherwise, it's going to get quite tricky. Now, the circuit board ended up roughly half an inch, 12.5 millimetres, by one inch, 25 millimetres. Uh, just because that's how it ended up, I could have made it smaller. I was just experimenting initially. This might go a little bit out of focus while I'm just poking around here. Let's put it roughly central just for the sake of appearance. And press it down, and that's that. Right here. Okay. Oh, call me just a little bit cynical. When you get an update from Lenovo from your phone and then it starts misbehaving directly after that update, that is so suspicious. Now, what I'm going to be soldering this with, that's uh, what happened there. It was a little blip. That's why it skipped. Uh, what I'm going to be soldering with is something that someone suggested I try. They saw it on eBay and thought it'd be worth taking a look at. This is a vaping battery and this is a heating element, it's got a nice firm pink tip here, but it's uh, 
the type of heating element that you find on the little USB soldering arms. Initially, I thought, is that really going to work? Because basically, they've made an adapter that lets that heating element get used in one of the batteries. Initially, I thought it was going to be supplied with one of these generic 88 vape style Ego type batteries. But in reality, what it's been supplied with is an adjustable one. Um, I think it's a clone, I'm not really sure. But it's got a little uh, knob in the end that you can adjust the voltage up for the power rating, so it's got a voldage booster in it. And the idea is that to solder with this, you click the button, but because if you held the button, because it's a vaping battery, it would just, after a while, it would flash and it go out. So you have to remember that when you're actually using it, you have to just occasionally just uh, click your finger off the button and on again. But what it means is that you've got a very, very convenient solder iron that incidentally can be used with things like this bat this uh, vaping device. You can actually screw it into the end of this one and convert that into a solder iron, which is an interesting thing. The secret uh, sauce here is this tiny little brass adapter that allows that heat element to be used in one of these battery packs. I've digressed again, haven't I? Well, not really, because that's what this uh, project's going to be about. I'm just going to move that tiny little piece of copper wire. The uh, solder iron stand is this folded metal thing, which uh, I'll fold it up, I'll give it a go. Mm -hmm. Put that down there. Um, I'll be using tweezers, the ceramic tip tweezers for picking up the components. I'll be using ordinary solder. Um, it came with solder, I'm not sure what type of solder it is, so I'm not going to trust it. Uh, it also came with a little charger, which I've written in a bit of tape, 5 volt out, because open circuit it puts out 5 volts, which isn't necessarily great for some of these devices. I've just dropped another little set of tweezers here, I'll stick them back up there. Let's begin the project. So to start with, uh, I'll zoom down in this, and this is where all everything went wrong last time, so hopefully it's not going to do anything weird. It may compromise on the resolution, I don't know, uh, but... It's, you know, it's the only way you're going to see this because it is, it's minute, it's tiny. So everything is ready, let's start making this up. So I shall start humping the button on the soda and we'll see how long this takes to come up to, to temperature. It's up to temperature. Let's uh, flick it off and put some soda on here. Which works, and then I'm going to get the diode. Oh, uh, and I'm going to turn it round, I'm going to drop it down like that, I'm going to put it on there, and I'm going to try and just, oh, you see, that's the problem with these wee round diodes, is they roll. Yeah, this, this has got off to a terrible start, hasn't it? Okay. So I want the negative hand going over there, and I want to try and solder on... Meanwhile, the soldering iron has cooled down. Well, this has got off to a fantastic start. This is where uh, some people would just stop the video, but I'm not going to stop the video. I'm going to keep battling on here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, solder one end of the diode and just to lock it in place, and then I'll retin that afterwards. I'll just reflow it afterwards a little bit. Let's see if I can actually manage to do it. The peril of surface mount it is so tiny. So now I've flowed that. I'm going to get the solder. I'm going to remember to keep pressing the button. That is one thing. You have to keep pressing the button in this to actually keep it awake. Uh, then I'm going to just flow some solder onto this end of the diode. And once that's cooled down, uh, I'll probably just reflow that and just to make sure it is completely... Melted. I'm going to have to get used to this, the fact you have to pump this uh, pump this button all the time. The next component that is going on is going to be the 10k resistor. Uh-oh. Right, this is where this is where I am going to struggle to see the numbers. Keep pumping the button. Uh, let me just grab my magnifying glass. Oh right, it's that it's that resistor there. Let's uh, grab that. And stick it on there, and flow the solder onto the end of that just to tack it in place. The good thing about the fact that you have to keep pressing the button is you're not going to run your battery flat accidentally, because you have to make a conscious effort to keep the solder iron on. I suppose really you'd get used to it if you're using this much at all, and it means that you know 
it uses a standard battery, or a standard style of battery, it means uh, it's going to be quite useful. I don't know how this would compare to the uh, USB style one. While I'm here, I'll also flow some solder onto these pads here. The advantage of the USB one is you can use it as a big fat battery pack, but I notice the latest versions of the USB ones tend to just stay on all the time. Uh, they don't have that automatic uh, shut off feature that uh, you have to impact them, bump them, or uh, touch the touch contact, turn them on. They just seem to latch on. Right, let's put the transistor into place. This is where theoretically I should be observing super EST precautions, but this is a deliberately a low static bench. Everything is optimized in the vicinity for uh, low risk of static damage. Okay, so that's that uh, pin soldered. Now we'll get the other pins. And this is where the tiny tip of this solder iron actually wins. Okay, and I'm just going to reflow that one at that side. Okay, with some fresh flux. Right, the next thing I'm going to do is, well, let's say I put, uh, I'm not sure this is a good idea, but I'm going to tin these pads. And then we'll add a couple of resistors. There are three positions, I'm just going to add two. Here is the first of those resistors. Oh, let's uh, put a little touch of soda on where that resistor's going in the first place. And the other one. So one resistor's going there. And the other resistor, actually, you know what, I'm doing better than I thought, you know, after that issue with the Roly diode at the beginning, it's not going too badly. Have I just cursed the project by uh, by saying that? I have, because I just forgot to push the button. So the solder is flowing. Okay. I know there are much more sophisticated solder irons available. The intelligent soldier rounds, the ones that theoretically could crash. I'm such a cynic, am I? And then go thermonuclear, even when they're supposed to be turned off. I'm not sure I trust things that uh, are overtly computer controlled, particularly if they involve heating elements. Right, that is the project built. So I'm going to zoom out just a wee tad now. I'm going to start putting connections on. So at this point I could bring, uh, well tell you what, let's put the uh, battery connections on now. So I'll take Trumpy Brick out the way at the moment and I shall flow some soda onto these battery connections. So soda iron. The solder iron is slightly annoying if you're doing a project like this. It's one, this is a situation where you wouldn't mind the solder iron being on all the time. But it's not that bad. You'd soon get used to it if you're using this a lot. It truly is an autonomous solder iron. So there are three connections here. Usually, uh, on the battery pack, it shows plus there and minus there. It gives you the set of indication of polarity. So let's get one of the leads and tin it. And we'll put the positive lead on. Technically speaking, it might have been an idea putting it onto the circuit board first instead of onto the battery. I may move down onto the workbench a bit at this point in time because, uh, focus wise, because, or should I bring the trumpy brick back in again? Let's bring the trumpy brick back up because, uh, it's not, it's not really too bad. Uh, let's uh, solder this onto the positive. The and then we'll get the negative connection. Oh, I'm not doing too well here, am I? It is a little bit fumbly. One thing is the, with the more capable with this little adapter, you could theoretically set the power rating 
of the vaping device up much higher. Uh, and that, that would run the heating element at a higher voltage. Let's tin this wire. It's certainly worth giving this a go. It has probably got its application, particularly in a toolkit where you're not actually building something from scratch, but you just occasionally need a bit of a juice and a little bit of heat. Uh, a solder, soldering iron in a small, confined space. Those of you who work in sort of maintenance will know the perils of the gas soldering irons that you end up leaving it on for too long. And when you do that, uh, it just sits in the background hissing. And I've had problems on sites with uh, site management not being happy about the fact I'm using a gas iron and making me have a hot work permit, which I'm not sure if that's really needed for a soldering iron. I suppose there's no harm in having a, a fire extinguisher handy if you are soldering with, with a gas iron. This would get round that, uh, although these days on modern building sites they'd still make you have a hot work permit in case you set fire to the site. That's what it's like these days, it's just box ticking, it's a, it's a wee bit annoying. That's okay, I don't work much on sites at all. Now, let's not touch these wires together, they are active now. So this is the negative. Let's let the tip come back up to temperature again. I'm also not sure what the battery itself with its active circuitry is going to think of a load that is being used in a really non-standard way. It wouldn't normally be switching current quite as much as this if you were actually vaping with it. Okay, so the battery is now connected to the circuit. Let's connect the set of terminals for the LEDs, so the positive goes on to here. Pauses momentarily while it heats up again. Technically speaking at this point in time, the LEDs should theoretically light up because there's no solar panel present if I was to plug the LEDs into this. This would be a good way to check the circuit so far. Okay. So let's bring the LEDs in and plug them in and see what happens. I shall plug them in like this. That looks pretty good. That's working. Okay, let's mount it on the solar panel. So I'll put that thing down in its little stand and uh, bring the solar panel in. Uh, the solar panel, how am I going to mount this? I could mount it round like that. So I shall put a couple of double-sided pads on the back of the battery. I shall stack a couple just to give it better spacing. So I'll put one here and I'll peel that off. And I shall put one on top of that existing one. So it's now two pads thick. Stack them up. Not necessarily perfectly aligned, but high, good enough. And I'll put the other pad at the other end of this and I'll stack it up again. So I'll peel the protective film off that and stick the other one on. Then I'll peel both the protective films off and then place it onto the solar panel. The two foam pads are just A to attach it to the solar panel and also to give it good distance from heat. So what way do I want to do this? There are the two solar inputs. That's positive up there, that's positive there. Let's put it roughly central-ish. And press it down at that. Okay. That looks all right. Now I'm going to get the solder iron ready again. And I've got a couple of uh, leads that I've prepared here. And I'm going to connect the solar panel onto these connections at the end now. So uh, back to clicking the button on this, uh, I shall also slurp a little bit of coffee. Mm. I've also not managed to sneeze while making this video. This is good because uh, I've been loaded with the cold at the moment. So let's tin these wires to start off with. Keep remembering to press the button on the solder iron.
Tin that wire. Tin that one. And then uh, I'm not using the bad dragon brick at the moment because uh, I don't want to damage it with soldering. It's quite a ornate thing. It's artistic. So I'm using the foam trumpy brick instead. An order of magnitude of price lower. The bad dragon brick was a gift though from bad dragon. Let's put uh, some solder onto the pads of the solar panel. Excellent. Uh, and since I'm already holding the negative, I shall put the negative one on. So these, uh, this little uh, solder iron does pack out quite, quite a punch of heat. It's not too bad. And I shall put on the positive pad as well. It's not obviously, because it's low mass, it's not quite got the oomph of a normal solder iron. But it's really not too bad. Squeaky, squeaky, squeaky of the solder. Uh, let that cool down a little bit. Keep remembering to press the button. I shall trim these because uh, when you flow a bit of solder onto the leads, it tends to make the uh, plastic insulation peel back a little bit. So let's uh, do this. Let's bring this round and go onto that pad. So that's the common positive pad that feeds the lithium battery and the LEDs. And the negative, which is the one that feeds the gate of the MOSFET and also the diode, which allows it to charge the lithium battery. The project is now effectively complete. So what should happen now is, if I turn this over and plug it in, uh, let's focus down on to, let's find something to focus a... Uh, box should be nice. Let's uh, make sure that did focus down there. Yes, it looks like it focused down there. Dimmable? Is it really? Is it really dimmable, that lamp? That was for a little test of uh, two versions of the same lamp, uh, and they didn't send me two versions of the same lamp. Okay, so theoretically it's in the light. The lights are not lit. Um, if I turn the overhead light off, if I take exposure off as well, if I turn it off, the lights turn on. I'm going to turn the light back on again. The lights turn off. It's working. Very, very simple bit of circuitry. And, it, you know, it's it does seem to take... I've not tried it outside to see what time it actually comes on intensity-wise. But um, that looks pretty good. It Actually, it takes a, a modest level of darkness before it actually starts turning the LEDs on. Yeah, that's pretty good. That's a good result. So, um... Oh, yes, that's what I was going to test. Let's test it to see if it's got that function that it protects against overloads. So the two battery connections, the positive and negative coming from the battery, I'm going to dab them with two resistors in parallel, two one-ohm resistors, let's get this stuff out of the way, to give a total of half an ohm, which is going to result in a controlled amount of current, but quite a lot of current. And if there is protection under load, like the LEDs lit at the moment, it should latch off. It has latched off. And the way to reset that is simply to show a bit of charge going in again, then turn it off, and they're back. So this battery pack does have, this uh, lithium cell does have the built-in protection. So yes, that's interesting. That's a good result. It works. Uh, this little soldier iron is actually quite usable. Um, and that's the first project I've done using a surface mount transistor, I think, the A2SHB. And so far, I am very impressed with those wee transistors. You, because they're super popular in China and uh, they're used in so many products, you can go on eBay and you can just buy small sections. This is 100 transi transistors and it's between two or three pounds, I think it is, it costs. Very good. Uh, so, yes, I'll be doing some more projects with those in the future especially seeing as how well this one turned out.